And I can remember standing on the ninth floor of the new graduate student lounge and thinking about how they would feel if I threw myself through that window and they found me on the floor. I was so distressed. It was one of the most distressed times I've ever had. How about this story uh, that you said that you tell all your graduates? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I, just about anybody I've come in contact with who is working on their dissertation, I tell this story. Because, um, well, I'll tell the story and I think you'll see why it's relevant. It, I mean, it's such a stress for people to, to, to do a doctoral dissertation. And, you know, one of the problems, I think, with academia is that it's a sort of a hierarchical system in the sense that uh, I'm the instructor and you're not, and so you need to do these things, and if you do them right, I'm going to give you a good grade, and maybe I'll write you a letter of recommendation, and maybe I'll advance your career, and maybe I won't. Well, so, so here's, here's, here's the problem with that, right? And I don't know what the answer to this is, but so who, got their, who gets their PhD? Well, in first grade, they're the kids who are sitting in the front row and saying, I know, I know. And then by middle school, they're still in the front row, I know, and there's a selection, you know, they're selecting and selecting smarter and smarter kids. And by the time they get to college, they're the ones who figured out how to please the, the professor. And, and that's, that's good to a great extent, but it can also get you so focused on, um, on what you're, on pleasing the professor that you don't think of anything that deviates from that. And in fact, every young behavior analyst, if they are concerned that, that the science of human behavior, as B.F. Skinner wrote about it in Science and Human Behavior, if they're concerned that that's not doing as much as, they, as it could, they need to, to follow their own counsel. It, it, they, if they just do what their professor said should be done, uh, we won't expand this. So anyway, that, with that as background, um, I got my degree in social psychology and organizational psychology at the University of Illinois. I knew nothing about uh, behavior analysis, um, at, or, or I, I hadn't read B.F. Skinner when I, by the time I got my PhD. But what I did for my dissertation was I looked at the characteristics of academic areas, and I did an analysis of how different scholars in all these different areas saw the relationships among all these areas. And one of the things I found was that if you, uh, I, I did a thing called multidimensional scaling. And multidimensional scaling has a bunch of stimulus objects, in this case, all of the different academic areas. And you arrange them in terms of the degree to which they're similar. So you get ratings of the similarities of these different things. What, how is psychology, how much is that like physics and so on. And so the, the common way of doing that at the time was that you got all, every uh, possible pair of stimuli and you had people rate how similar they were. So I needed to get uh, faculty members in 36 academic areas to do this. And that would be n times n minus one over two comparisons. Now, how many faculty members do you think I could get to do all those ratings? So I figured, okay, we'll take a, a cards, 36 cards, and we, I would, I'll just ask them, put them in piles, if they're similar or not similar. And you know, some would give me three piles, and some would give me 10 piles, and so on. But then I constructed a matrix where it was a one if they said it was the same, and a zero if they said it wasn't, and then I collapsed over all of that, and that was my similarities matrix. And that's what I analyzed. And I got three dimensions out of this, one was paradigm versus non-paradigm. So all the physics, engineering, hard sciences were at one end, and things like uh, literature and history and so on were at the other end. Oh, and by the way, psychology was sort of at the soft end. This is in 1971, I think. So anyway, uh, I do this analysis. I write up the dissertation. I go back to Illinois to do my final orals. And I do my final orals, and I go out of the room, and I'm out for quite a while. That's raising my anxiety. And then they call me back in, and they say, well, we're going to give you your, 
your degree, but you need to talk to this faculty member who'd been added to the committee and who was a methodologist. So I go and meet with him and he says, well, I, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, raise this, but the, the method you used to, uh, to do this was simply inappropriate uh, to get these similarities. And so um, then I ran in that afternoon to my friend Jerry Unkin, who had also done his dissertation and done his final orals the same day, and he was in and out in an hour. And I can remember standing on the ninth floor of the new, uh, the new um, psych, uh, graduate student lounge and thinking about how they would feel if I threw myself through that window and they found me on the floor. I was so distressed. It was one of the most distressed times I have ever had. So uh, I eventually got into clinical psychology. I got out of that and I was uh, maybe maybe 10 years later, probably maybe more than 10 years later, I'm at Oregon Research Institute and our librarian comes to me and she gives me a, a journal article. And the journal article was uh, The Bigland Model and the Smart Messenger, Case Study of an Eponym. So I go to the library to look up what an eponym is and it's something that's named for somebody. And it turns out that after I left this field, at some point, a guy named Smart published a paper referring to my work and calling it the Bigland model. And you can search on Google, and the Bigland model has been extensively used, uh, particularly in, uh, in uh, academic or organizations and in, in, um, also in library science. So um, I'm famous in an area I almost killed myself because I was told that I did the wrong thing. So I, I always tell graduate students that because you know, if you think, oh, I might be wrong and so on, that's okay. Uh, you might be right too. First light, first time I see it. And I was so. Old.